All right, thank you. Thank you for having me here, and uh, thanks for uh, being in my presentation. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about deep reinforcement learning for robotics. And let me start with the uh, motivation of why we started working in this direction in my group at uh, UC Berkeley. So really what we're starting to see back around 2011, 2012, 2013 was that traditional computer vision, which processed images this way, that is, you have an image, but raw pixels are difficult to deal with, so you transform it into a histogram of edges called hog or sift or daisy, different tweak, different PhD thesis. You feed that into a support vector machine and train it to classify what's in the image. And that was being supplanted with the NIPS 2012 paper from Hinton's group by huge neural net, many, many parameters. But their work showed that if you had enough data and enough compute power, you can train such a deep neural net, find the right setting of all the weights in the neural net such that this performs better than these traditional approaches. Now, what I mean with better? A standard benchmark in computer vision is ImageNet. In ImageNet, there's a yearly competition. Horizontal axis is years, 2010, 2011, and so forth. Vertical axis is time, uh, is error, so lower is better. What you see here on the first column is entries in 2010. The lowest one is the best one. And then you see that there's a little bit of a trend there just getting slowly better over time. Then the Hinton entry landed right there, um, significantly better but also accelerated progress. So a lot of people switched to deep learning, except for this, you can see still one blue circle there. Everybody else switched to deep learning, and we see an acceleration in progress, not just one step forward. And this continues to be the case right now. Same thing happened in speech, actually slightly earlier, where um, deep learning allowed much faster progress than was possible with more hand-engineered approaches that people were looking at before. So this is all fantastic, and uh, there's a lot of progress being made, but let's take a look at robotics. So what's happening there? If you want to get a robot to do something, what is the standard approach? You would say, well, the robot has percepts, maybe accelerometers, gyros, cameras, and so forth. You then set up something like a common filter or a particle filter to estimate the state of the robot, probably also the state of the world around the robot, which is even harder to deal with. And then you set up some control policy class that takes that state estimate and turns it into, hopefully, some kind of action the robot would take. And usually there's some parameters you tweak to get this to work. And maybe you run reinforcement learning to tweak those 10 parameters the way people would run support vector machine learning in the past to tweak a few parameters for their vision system. But why not just replace the whole thing with a deep neural net? Ultimately, the three boxes in between are just doing calculations. A deep neural net can do a lot of computations, very flexible. Give it enough data, it'll find out the right thing to compute. So maybe we could do that. Turns out it's not the same problem. So there's something fundamentally different about robotics than there is what you face in computer vision or speech recognition. And the difference is vision and speech are phrased as supervised learning problems. You get examples of an input and a matching output, and you're supposed to curve fit from input to output. That's essentially what you have to do there. It's not an easy problem, but it's one that's now becoming well understood. In robotics, you have a feedback loop. So you still might have your deep neural net, which is now called pi theta, where theta is a parameter with maybe a million uh, entries, parameter vector with a million entries, that is your weights in your neural net. And that neural net pi theta will map from state to a distribution over actions. That's still just input to output, but then it's not done there. That output results in an action. That action changes the world. You're then now expected to deal with the consequences of your actions, and this repeats. People will, not, in these kind of settings, you don't get the same kind of supervision. You don't get told how good an action was, which action you should have taken. It's too tedious, because this is a continuous cycle. So typically what you get is instead a reward function that tells you how good is the current situation, and that reward function might be very sparse. This might be as sparse as, Robot's doing some cooking. Half an hour later, meal gets put on the table, so to say, and then you give it a one to five stars, and that's your reward. And that's the only supervision it's going to get, and it has to tease out what in that past half hour was good and bad, and leading up to a high score versus a low score. So it's a very different kind of supervision. It's not only in robotics you're faced with these kinds of problems. Marketing and advertising, once you have an interaction with your potential customer that's not just broadcasting to them, you have a similar kind of problem where you're estimating state of your customer, see if you want to 
contact them again, and so forth. Dialogue is interactive, plays out over time. Anything that is sequential over time, where there's interaction, will essentially be a reinforcement learning problem rather than a supervised learning problem. All right, so what are some different challenges there? Technically, it comes down to these three. The first one is stability. Let's say you learn a really good neural net that kind of matches what people would do, and you then deploy it. Maybe in your self-driving car, who knows? You deploy it, it takes its first step. It's never perfectly matched to what people would do, or what the demonstrator did. What would happen is you slightly veer off the normal track. At that point, you're faced with a situation that's less common, that's not so well represented in your training data, because you did something slightly different from what the demonstrators would do. And you'll make a slightly bigger mistake. And this can spiral out of control where you start making bigger and bigger mistakes because the distribution of data that you encounter starts changing as a consequence of initially just making small mistakes. Credit assignment is the problem of the very sparse supervision. You're only told at the end of the cooking session how many stars you get for that meal. Now, how do you tease apart what was good, what was bad? Was the fact that you burned the meat at the end that is actually screwing it all up and you get a one star? Or was it something else? We have prior knowledge, we can figure this out, but if you're reinforcement learning, Learning from scratch, you don't have that knowledge. You need to tease apart what might have been the main contributors. Exploration is the problem of finding out what even exists in the world. The robot would just go around in the world, find out what exists. It's not being told ahead of time what it's supposed to be doing. It just gets rewarded when it does something good. And so it has to discover what the good things are to be able to succeed. So those are three different problems, making it a harder problem than supervised learning. How hard? Well, here's an example. Um, let me give you some sound also. <laughs> so what are we looking at here? This is footage from the DARPA Robotics Challenge held in June 2015. This was a $2 million prize challenge. Many teams worked on this for multiple years. Many of the <laughs> best robotics teams in the world worked on this for multiple years. Um, yet, this is the kind of things you got to see. Now, I'm not saying these are the best, best, best performances that happened there. There were certainly better performances than these, but what this is indicating is that there's no such thing as, let me just con contact a cloud service or download a little program that can learn to control a robot for walking, because if that existed, people would have used this. <laughs> All right. Enough fun with the robots. Um, so what we started looking at is, can we have a robot learn to do locomotion on its own? A bit like a toddler. It's never walked before. It doesn't even know what walking is. We're just going to give it reward for how far forward it gets. We don't tell it what walking is like. The further forward, the better. And hitting the ground hard is bad. So only two components to the reward function. How hard you hit the ground, how far forward you get. We set it up in a very open-ended way. There is a deep neural net that goes from joint angles, joint velocities, and where the main torso is, to torques at each of the motors. And any setting of all the parameters in the neural net makes for a controller. And so we initialize randomly. And so when we start out, this random neural net gives this kind of behavior. But from its own experience, it finds better settings of the parameters in the neural net, <laughs> figures out how to fall less hard onto its face, and to get further forward. And it really invents walking here. Iteration there means a choice of the settings of all the weights in the neural net. So iteration 640 is the first time it fully completes, is a 640th choice of all the weights in the neural net. Per choice of weights, each iteration, we run 500 seconds of attempts under that setting, use that data to then compute a better setting. I'll tell you a little more about that later. Exact same algorithm, no change, different robot. And so that's the beauty here, is you don't need to change the algorithm. You don't need expertise about two-legged locomotion versus four-legged locomotion. In this case, this simulator is slightly unrealistic. So it actually learns to run super, super, super fast um, not realistic, but hey, we're rewarding it the faster it goes forward, and it figures out a really fast uh, locomotion gate in the simulator. Here's another example. The reward function here is as simple as the height of the head. Okay, so it's trying to get its head higher up, higher reward for the head higher up. 
There's nothing else that we say about what it should do to succeed, but on its own, it figures out that there is a way to get its head high up at standing height. So what's underneath? Um, I told you in reinforcement learning, we tried to optimize rewards. It's a stochastic system, so expected sum of rewards over time is being optimized. Then the approach we use is policy optimization. So pi theta is our big neural net. It's being optimized, and that's the mapping from joint angles, joint velocities to torques. Theta is the parameter vector. For any current choice of that parameter vector, you can simulate a bunch of times and see empirically how well is it doing. If you change the parameters, you can do it again, and you can compare. So you can compare when you have a better setting of your parameters. Now, just doing a random search that way will take a long time. So we run a policy gradient method. So what we do is we essentially compute an estimate of the local gradient using something like backprop, not exactly the same thing because it's a stochastic uh, objective. Um, the gradient is only locally a good approximation, so we define a trust region to ensure that we don't step too far in the gradient direction. And this turns out to be very important, especially in reinforcement learning, where a change in your policy will change what parts of the state space that you visit. And so there's an amplifying effect there, a destabilizing effect if you make changes that are too large. But once you think about this carefully, you can actually get learning to walk up and running for two-dimensional systems. Um, if you want to go to 3D, you need to do something a little more, something called generalized advantage estimation. What happens in, at the inner loops of these algorithms, so you're computing this expected sum of rewards. But that's based on rollouts. And those rollouts are stochastic. And so you get a noisy estimate of how good your current policy is. And generalized advantage estimation works around that in a clever way to get better estimates of how good your current policy is. Once you do that, you're able to get that three-dimensional walking to work. But other things too. The exact same algorithm works to learn to play Atari games. Here, it just gives as input pixels, output joystick actions. We weren't the first to do this. There was work at DeepMind, DQN, which is Q-Learning, a different approach. Um, there's work at Michigan with Monte Carlo Tree Search. There's our trust region policy optimization. Um, it does turn out that the latest results from DeepMind that were presented at NIPS this past December were actually using this trust region policy optimization, uh, generalized advantage estimation type approach rather than Q-learning. OK, so, but this is still just simulation. And it's very easy to make fun of things that are real robots but then only show results in simulation, which is admittedly easier to get to work than real systems. So how about real robot skills? Well, let's think about this. Um, one thing that's fundamentally different is that the amount of experience you need in simulation is, in our case, about two days of experience for learning to walk. That's a long time to put this on a real robot, thinking about the fact you need to try multiple times, change hyperparameters, and so forth. So we put in a stronger prior here. So this neural net has a softmax layer boxed in red that reduces the complexity and puts in a prior that visual layers are supposed to output coordinates about whatever is in the image. We don't tell it what it needs to look at. We just tell it outputs from the visual processing need to be in the form of coordinates. And that goes into the motor control layers. Still 92,000 parameters. Another trick we play is rather than directly maximizing expected reward under the policy pi theta, which is a difficult problem, we choose a small set of problems that we think are more easily solvable. So I here in this objective is indexing over problems. Could be robot is holding something, there's a target, and it needs to move to that particular target. And then if you change the target, that's a different index i. And we pick a set of problems like that. It turns out for very specific problems where you don't need a general capability, it's easier to find good control policies. Those are our policies pi i for very specific situation i. And then what we enforce is that our policy pi theta, which is general, is supposed to generalize across all situations, coincides with the policies pi i wherever they are being used. Okay? So the first thing is then solving for policies pi i, which is a very specific problem, which can be done. And then the second thing here is a supervised learning problem matching those policies. Okay, so here is an example of that in action. Every different location of the cube corresponds to a different i, and it's learning that policy for each i, as well as a neural net that goes directly from images to uh, motor torques. And you see that in about, this is a sped up video, but in about an hour, it can learn how to place the block in the matching opening. OK, 
can not just learn that, it can learn other skills too. So here's an example of some skills it picked up on. Um, here's the camera view. Um, it's placing the coat hanger onto the bar. It's placing the block. This is the robot's view. It's placing the hammer, the claw of the hammer. What's interesting here is we never tell it to pay attention to the nail, we never tell it to pay attention to the hammer or how it's holding the hammer, but it knows that to match those specific policies, pi, i's, torques, the only way you can predict those torques is by paying attention to the hammer, to the nail, and so forth. Where is this going? So what are some of the frontiers? Um, I think the biggest frontier right now is transfer learning and shared learning. What do I mean, what do I mean with that? What you've seen so far, whether it's Atari games, or locomotion, or robotic manipulation, it's always one neural net being learned for one specific task. When you're faced with a new task, it relearns a new neural net from scratch. It uses the same algorithm, so it's a general approach, but it has to learn from scratch. There's no reason it should be that way. If you look at something like ImageNet, there's no separate neural net for dogs and a separate one for cats. It's all sitting in one big neural net, and that helps. Same thing should be true here, across robots, across tasks, and so forth. Memory. Everything I've shown to you here has been going from current percepts to torques or to joystick actions. But typically, you see something there, now you're looking at another direction. What's there, you remember it, and you use it in your decisions even when you're facing this way. That's memory, and that needs to be built into the systems. That means you need recurrence in your neural nets. They're harder to train. On top of that is the reinforcement learning problem, so it's a harder problem, but that is something really important to figure out. Related to that is goal setting. What you've looked at is going straight from inputs to actions. A more natural architecture would say, I have inputs. Based on that, I set some goals that a lower level system would try to achieve. That lower level system, maybe in its turn, can set goals for yet a lower level system, and you'd have a hierarchy of decision making happening. That's not happening here yet. But if you want to make long-term decisions, a robot that takes decisions for a day, even just for an hour, you'll need something like that beyond just the reactive systems I've shown you here. Another thing that's very interesting that's starting to happen is, even though for me, the reason I got excited about this direction is because I thought it could really get us somewhere in robotic locomotion and manipulation, we're actually now working on driving and flight just as well. What's happening here is that the fabric underneath is actually not specific to manipulation or locomotion. It's just specific to the fact that this is a sequential decision-making problem. You have inputs, outputs, delayed reward. That's what you have to deal with. And so I think just like maybe 10 years ago, you would find the expert in speech recognition, then find the expert in computer vision to be totally different people, having totally different expertise. That's not true anymore right now. People who have the state-of-the-art results in vision often also have state-of-the-art results in speech. Same thing will happen in robotics. Right now, often still, you'll find the manipulation lab versus a walking lab versus a driving lab. I think the next five years, we'll see that change because the fabric underneath is unifying across all those application domains. Thank you.